just trying to de-escalate the situation because I couldn't get out. I didn't know where to go. I didn't even just leave. Like, all I wanted to do was just leave. I just wanted nothing to do with that. Do you know what she hit her head on? Was it the floor or? I don't know. It just, she just fell and then she just she wasn't responsive after that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Say love you. Bye. Trisha Todd was many things. Loving, vivacious, stable, and most importantly, a nurturing mother to her little daughter. She was anything but someone who would willingly abandon her life and vanish into thin air. In that urgent search for a missing Florida mom, gone for more than a week now. Police say she disappeared without a trace, and they are grasping for leads to try and help track her down. The information that they got was that you had been down there and had recently seen her. Yeah, so obviously they're talking to everybody that's had any contact with her during, you know, general periods of time. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to come here being an asshole. Just right. asshole. Like, look, let's get this done, do what needs to be done, and like you said, just move on. Yeah. Authorities say her ex, Stephen Williams, is not a suspect and voluntarily took a polygraph test. No physical evidence or witness testimony links Mr. Williams with Trisha Todd's disappearance. When she was finally found, her body had been dismembered and stashed away in containers filled with acid. Just as shocking as the grisly murder, the discovery of the monster who had done it was even more jolting. It was her ex-husband, Stephen Williams. Stephen Williams crossed paths with Trisha Todd at a young age while they both lived in Hope Sound, Florida. As the years passed and their bond deepened, it only seemed natural to spend the rest of their lives together. While they entered into a new chapter together, they also welcomed their baby girl named Faith. With her arrival, the family seemed harmonious at first. However, like most marriages, they faced challenges, which eventually got the best of their 11-year-long marriage and it came to an end. Despite the difficulties, the separation was amicable and there was no lingering animosity. They both shared the responsibilities of faith equally and peacefully and moved on with their lives. Stephen remained in North Carolina as he continued his job in the Air Force, while Trisha took faith and moved back to her hometown, Hobe Sound, and became a registered nurse at a hospice. This, of course, meant that Stephen couldn't see Faith all the time. But every opportunity he got to come see her, he did, and they would have a joyful time as they once did as a family. However, everything took a drastic turn on that fateful day, April 26, 2016, when Trisha shockingly disappeared. The day began like any other day that Stephen decided to visit Faith and Trisha in Hope Sound. He booked an Airbnb for a week and went over to Trisha's house to reunite with his family. That evening, Trisha could not stay with them due to work reasons, so Stephen spent the rest of the evening with his daughter, and then took her back to his Airbnb while Trisha was gone. The following morning, he left Faith under the supervision of a babysitter, expecting her to be picked up that afternoon by Trisha. But she never did, prompting the babysitter to inform Trisha's family. Upon reaching her house, Trisha's family took note of the unusual spot her car was parked in, across the street. Upon further investigation, they could see that her purse was lying on the passenger seat and the keys were still in the ignition. Inside her home, all the lights were turned on and fresh groceries were lying on the counter, unopened. This was all out of character for Trisha, so law enforcement was immediately informed. For the first few days, there was no sign of Trisha. So the officers revisited the beginning of this case, what they first saw when they inspected her house. The unpacked fresh groceries indicated that she had been shopping that day, so they scanned through multiple supermarkets until they found the one that she had visited. According to the CCTV footage, Trisha didn't show any signs of distress or any sign that she would disappear, leaving behind her daughter and family. The investigations progressed to questioning the people who last saw her, and on this list was her ex-husband, Stephen. He fully cooperated with the officers and stated that he had last seen her when she accompanied him and their daughter to his Airbnb. According to Stephen, she left abruptly without stating a proper reason, and up until the officer showed up, he had assumed that she had picked up Faith from his place. Trisha is missing. The information that they got was that you had been down there and had recently seen her. Yeah, so obviously they're talking to everybody that's had any contact with her during, you know, general period of time. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to come here being an asshole, just right asshole. Like, look, let's get 
this done, do what needs to be done, and like you said, just move on. Yeah. So I'm not gonna like, why well, I want a lawyer, damn it. Like, yeah, I'm just gonna come in here and do the right thing. And hopefully it gets us closer to finding her. I want my daughter to have her mother. I want her to be found and hopefully she is okay. Because I feel like I'm living a TV drama right now. Like, oh, the ex-husband comes to town and all of a sudden the, the ex-wife goes missing. Great, that's freaking awesome. That's what I want to do. Because that, that, that doesn't look awkward or suspicious to anybody. Like, you know, I'm not stupid. Like, I get it. So I text her, like, hey, make it super stuff fuzzy. I know it's late, but if you're up kind of thing, like, would you mind coming to comic her or whatever? And then, like, she would text back, like, on my way. Awesome. So, a few minutes go by. She comes over. She sits with Faith. Faith is happy now. 1230, 1 o'clock right now. Probably. Yeah. She leaves. Faith is asleep. And then, well, she didn't leave, actually. Her car was out of gas. <laughs> Which, that really frustrates me. That's her thing. Her car never has gas in. Then, uh, uh, she mentioned that there's, there's a gas station up the street. And I was like, you know what? Gas station, gas can. You got any money? I'll just drive my car. I'll go get you a gas can. It's gas. No big deal. So she gives me a 20. I leave. I leave the gas station maybe a half mile down. Get the gas can, pay for it, get two gallons of gas, leave for the gas in her car, and then I told her, good night, basically. I'll contact you tomorrow, you can call me or whatever. That's it. To further authenticate himself, he offered to sit for a polygraph, which he cleared with flying colors. Given all counts of his willingness and decent history, Stephen was quickly removed from the list of suspects. No physical evidence or witness testimony links Mr. Williams with Trisha Todd's disappearance. Following this, a breakthrough in the case occurred when officers discovered a journal that belonged to Trisha. It contained many aspects of her life that even her own family was unaware of. Firstly, she had fallen in love with a new man. He was followed by the officers for several days in hopes of him leading them to Trisha. Unfortunately, this man was a musician who had only met Trisha once, so all suspicions about him were dropped. However, that wasn't the most shocking part of her journal logs. In it, she revealed a dark aspect of her marriage that otherwise seemed perfect. Behind closed doors, Stephen was physically abusive towards her. But this abuse extended beyond human targets, as he abused animals, including Trisha's pets. He even killed one of them in front of her to show his superiority. All of this caused Stephen's name to reappear on the list of suspects. But what further assured the police that he may be involved with Trisha's disappearance were witness reports stating that they saw a male figure matching Stephen's appearance driving away from the Airbnb in Trisha's car. Now that the detectives were aware of a whole new side to Stephen, they were prompted to bring him in for questioning. You got a lot going for you. You're good looking, you're young, you got your shit straight, and you got this crazy, that shit crazy ex. She's come after you before. Did she come after you that night? Something happened. And you were just, oh shit, what do I do now? No, she never came after me, nothing. It's an overwhelming amount of evidence pointing at you. So help me continue painting this picture of you. I don't want, I don't want to portray Stephen as a cold-blooded killer. Stephen, it's okay, okay. You're so tense, you just relax. Okay, I just need to know where she's at, Stephen. I don't know where she is. Stephen, you know where she's at. I don't, I really don't. Do you remember taking her car and leaving? Yes or no? I need you to work with me. I need to tell them that you're being 100% honest with me. First time I left. Okay. She asked me to go back and get her laptop so she could keep working. I said, okay, you and Faith are here. She's happy. So then you don't have to leave. And she freaks out. I'll go. Okay. So I leave. Makes sense. She the car barely had any gas. And I'm thinking I can make it, but it doesn't look like it. I just turn around and go back. I came back, she was lying on the floor, and she wasn't very responsive. And I kind of freaked out, because I'm like, oh my god, now she's lying on the floor, she's not responsive, and this looks really bad, because I can't explain this. She's breathing, but she's not responding. And so I just put her in the car, and I'm just driving and thinking. That she passed away in that car. 
There was nothing you did to her. She just passed away. And then you freaked out even more. Is that fair to say? Like, but did you just lay her down somewhere at, out in the open? Yes, but if I her lay there, too peaceful. You're just lying Maybe. there and you're breathing shallow. I can't call. Dana? I don't know where the hell I even am. We had already determined that she had passed while she was in the car. You can't go backwards. Tell me she was shallow breathing. It was breathing. shallow. It was really shallow. I was hoping she would just snap out of it and come back. According to his recollection, Trisha had asked him to pick up her laptop from her workplace. When he went to do so, he noticed Trisha's car was blocking the driveway of the Airbnb, so he decided to just take hers instead. But halfway through, he felt it was unnecessary and turned around to return to his place. As he did so, he realized that her car was almost running out of gas. So when he informed her about it, she handed him a $20 bill and asked him to take his car and purchase gas and a gas can. And when he had returned, he found her lying on the floor unconscious. As bizarre as this story was, his explanations during the questioning did not help to lessen it. Please. It's Tom Backdoll. Hi. Oh, we haven't met yet. What's your name? Steven Woods. Steven. With a P or a V? V. V? Okay. I just got a couple questions. I've had an opportunity to listen to some of your statements to Jesse today. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been involved from the very beginning. And there's just a couple of things in my mind I need to clear up. So if you don't mind answering a couple of questions, I'd appreciate it. Do you mind talking to me? Sure. Okay. And and you've been very cooperative. And I understand you flew down here with these guys. And I guess you even stayed in the same hotel room and so forth on the way down. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And they told you all of your rights and everything. And you've indicated that you have no problem cooperating with them. Is that how you feel about this? Yes. Okay. And, and certainly I appreciate that. I assume that what you're trying to do is put this all behind you. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Um, so if, well, the only thing I heard you and Jesse talking about and I just got here was obviously the night that your ex-wife disappeared, but there was something that you had mentioned about kind of referring to drama or drama or her being dramatic. Can you kind of expound on that for me? Because I'm not quite sure I follow what you meant, that she talked a lot and was kind of dramatic. Tell me what you mean by that. She's always overly dramatic in her storytelling. It, everything's bigger than what it really was. Everything was more exciting than it really was. But that's just how she is. That's how she, she likes to embellish her stories. It's and, a redhead. And I'm like, that's fine. I don't care. Once again, mm -hmm. divorce. I have my own life. You have your own life. If you want to embellish your stories now, embellish your way. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. Right. Truth, you knew you were coming? Yeah. We discussed it. I told her when I would be there, and I only plan to stay three to four days. And just like in the past, our our, our schedule is always very fluid. We never made like, hey, you're going to be here at this time. We're going to meet at this place. It's always just been like, hey, let me know when you get here. Right. You can come get faith. And the same for dropping her off. It's always just been the same way. Just let me know. Send me a message. Give me a call. It's always been that way. It's always been really easy and, you know, nice that we don't have this, like, super strict regimen of, like, this is how it has to be. So Right. Well, and that's a, that's an interesting point to me. To, to understand the dynamics of your relationship. I know people get divorced for any number of reasons, but the dynamics of your relationship post, I don't even want to call it divorce because you were separated for a longer period of time than that was fairly amicable. I mean, you all got along? Sometimes. Uh, I don't know why, but whenever we were in person, she was very nice and very amicable. Yeah. But anytime, like via Skype or over the phone, it was she was a different person. Um, it was more of a, you need to do this and you have to do that and you owe me this. And I'm thinking... I don't know you anything. Like I've given you everything I'm supposed to. I've done everything I'm supposed to do, and then some. And I don't know why you feel like I still owe you something, or why I'm still obligated to do something for you. Stephen has already begun to paint a picture where Trisha appears to be the troubled one. All the while, he portrays himself to be the nonchalant ex-husband. This, however, was far from the truth. Why do you think she acted differently when you would be not face to face versus when you were? on the internet. I don't know any of that, that Skype nonsense. So, but. And even not, even, I don't know. Like, it, me and Laura always, like, because Laura was there for some of our Skype sessions, and she would see 
how she would just act. It just she just wasn't the same person over Skype. And I tell her like when I'm there, she's never like this. Like she doesn't act that way. She doesn't act this full of herself. You like you know mightier than thou kind of like she doesn't mm-hmm. act like that when I'm in person with her. And I don't understand that why over electronic means or whatever you're you're just not the same you ever hear of the concept of beer muscles do you know what beer muscles are you're in the military you gotta know you don't no, no. you know how some guys drink and they get they get mouthy and they get aggressive and they you know what i mean they call that beer muscles so they might not act like that when they're not drinking do you think that she felt like she could treat you poorly when you all weren't face to face you know and she didn't have to worry about maybe any physical repercussions or getting into any, you know, problems with you when you're over the internet? Do you think that could I be think it? it was just more of her trying to push buttons because she yeah. can. She likes to get a rise out of me and anyone, honestly, like I said, even when we first got married, she would talk, when well, she did talk to my mom because my mom didn't like her at first either. She would just say like off the topic things to get a rise out of my mom. And my mom, of course, wouldn't react. I told her like, if you know me, you know my mom. It's, well, what is she? What kind of things would she say to you, or could she say to you that would get a rise out of you? Uh, there was one example where I told her, like, "Hey, I'm gonna like, you know, it's been three months now. I've been paying for your cell phone. Look, we're this is done. Like, you're not coming back. I've asked you to come back. You're not. That's fine. I'm turning off the cell phone. Like, there's no reason why I still need to continue paying for your cell phone when you're clearly not coming back here. And so I told her, like, "Hey." You have until this date, which was more than even a month, to make other arrangements, transfer the number, do whatever you want to do. But after this time, that phone won't be on anymore. And just the backlash I got about how I owed her and I should still be paying her cell phone bill. And and I'm thinking, like, I don't owe you a cell phone bill. Like, you have a job, you're working, you have... How long have you been separated when that happened? maybe four months or so. Okay. And it was just like, I've been paying it all this time and I didn't complain. I didn't say anything, but now it's getting to a point where I'm like, why am I still paying your cell phone bill? And this is clearly the route we're going here. Like it doesn't make sense. Did you feel like most of the time in your relationship when things got difficult or heated, it always had something to do with money. I think we, you and I have been talking for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Money's come up. Four or five times, and that always happens in divorce situations. Like that, but, issues yeah. uh, that we argued about. Just, it was always a circle of things, um, same arguments. It just got to the point where there were no safe topics in the home, and I just decided I was done. I don't want to. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live in a miserable mm-hmm. home where every time I open my mouth, we're arguing, and it didn't seem to matter about what it was, you know. And I just grew up in a happy home with one parent than to grow up in a miserable home with two parents where they fight and yell all the time. In these period of years after the separation arguments, once you all aren't living together anymore, I understand once once you're in a relationship that doesn't work, there's no fixing it. And I get, you know, what you're saying there. But in terms of disputes or disagreements you all would have post separation, would did you find that they were always or primarily about money? No. The only thing you really argue about was it, it upset me that she didn't prioritize that. Um, in her mind, it was more, but if I don't, then sorry for you. And I'm like, all I'm asking for is 10 to 15 minutes, Monday through Friday, that's it. And if you need to move the time, let me know. If you know you're not gonna be there at five, don't wait till 5.50 something to tell me you're not gonna come online. Tell me at three, tell me at noon. Just tell me, hey, today's not a good day. Even Can we try again tomorrow? Fine, I'm very flexible that way. Don't but, string me along. But yeah, I'll, I'll tell her like, hey, I'm online. And then she'll be like, oh, 10 minutes. Okay, I'll wait 10 minutes. 30 minutes will go by. Oh, I'll be on in five. Another 20 minutes will go by. Okay, try again tomorrow. I just, it got to yeah. the point where I'm like, I'm not going to bother even getting upset. I'll just try again tomorrow. So you're down. You got this place for how many days do you have it booked for? I booked it for the week. And that's because when I originally booked it, which was much earlier than when I came down, I didn't know exactly how long I'd be there. I knew I didn't plan to stay the whole week, but most people, when you, you're like, you're sending your request, you're requesting so many days Uh and they have to approve it. Well, in the past, I tried a bunch of different people first. Most people don't want two to three days. They want you to do four to five days. So I was like, hey, if I just request four to five days and I don't take all four to five days, whatever. Especially because when I looked at it, it was at a super low rate of like $67. When pre- prior to this date, when I booked it, it was over $100 a day. And I'm like, well, this is a deal. 
I'm already getting it for half of what I was already going to pay for. So the two days that I don't plan on staying here, if I don't stay, I don't even care. Like right. I already booked it for half of what it's I was still cheaper than the hundred or whatever it was before. Exactly. I got and it was cheaper than any hotel and I didn't want to do a hotel. So before you come down, do you call Trisha and say, I'm coming from April, whatever, 24th? We talked via Skype. I told her when I would be there. Okay. And, and did you intend to time that you were here? The time, yeah, the time frame that I was going to be here, I, t I told her, yeah, just like I always do. The time together, we, you know, she stays with me, unless there's an issue, which there usually isn't. Um, there was a time in the past where there was, and I, I, you know, took her back to her mom's house, and that was fine. Okay, it's all set up. When is the first day you, what's the first day you get her, April? It was Monday. I came down. What is it? Yeah, help me out. 25th. 25th. Okay, Monday, the 20th. I'm going to take a note so I, because I, I get lost. All right, so you come down, you pick her up on Monday the 25th. Yes. Was she, did, had Trisha told you that she was ill at that time or no? No, I had no inclination that she was an ill. You first picked her up on the 25th? She just had a stuffy and she was a little congested, but I thought it was, I was hoping it was just minor, nothing big. Okay. Um, I didn't realize how bad it was. You, okay, so you came down here in... I, the car that I saw in the video at the gas station. What is that? That red? Was it red? What is that? What kind of car is that? Red Ford Fusion. That's your car? Yes. Okay. Um, you drove down in that? Yes. Okay. Pack light, pack heavy. What? How did you prepare for the, I mean, what was your? I packed a small suitcase because it fit in the trunk. And then I packed another bag just for extra clothes. I always try to okay. pack a little extra just because crap happens. Or if I did stay longer than I expected whatever i had a few extra clothes and i didn't know if i was going to be able to have access to the washer and dryer that were there i didn't know that there was yeah it said that but i've been in a place before where they say they have a washer and dryer and you get there and you're like i mean it's here but now it's see. another story yeah that or you got to get a key and the key is at this person's place and I'm I mean, like, you strike me as a kind of fastidious guy very organized and neat and are you kind of a neat freak type person you think no, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be clean, but that's about it. Okay. So um, you say you packed a bag, what, like a suitcase bag with wheels on it. What, what kind it's of bag? Like a, it's a small, I think it's an American Airlines bag, actually. And I know in all of your cooperation, you let them go in your house. You've let them search. You've done yeah, everything that they've asked. You've been completely and utterly cooperative. Is that bag up at your house now in, in Raleigh? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So you time in the afternoon on Monday the 25th do you think you pick her up? I don't I don't even remember what time it was I just, well, how long of a drive is it from Raleigh? oh from Raleigh? it's I came down Sunday Okay. I came down the day before and that oh. was a last minute decision because Laura was like hey if you drive down and get there Monday it's like 10 plus hours so like you're going to drive 10 hours and then pick up your daughter and have to you know spend time with her and everything like you're going to be exhausted so she suggested that I drive down Sunday get a hotel, sleep the night, and then Monday go get her. And I was like, you know, that okay. doesn't make much more sense. Okay. And literally on the road down, I booked the hotel, uh, that Fairfield, which was, it was 60-something dollars, but I had some credits through Expedia, so I made it $34 for You're the like a wheeler dealer guy. You got the just, bread, bed, bed and Well, that Airbnb. was just from all credits, and it said you can apply these credits. And I was like, okay. well, sweet. All right, so what you afternoon, before lunch, after lunch? Up, in the afternoon, I remember, because I came over in the morning to get the home. Okay. And at nine, because Candy on her site says, oh, you know, check-ins at nine. So I showed up a little before nine. And then I messaged her to ask, you know, well, how do I gain access? You know, where's the key? Are you coming over? Like, you know, what what's your routine? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I probably should have asked you beforehand until, you know, instead of wait until now. Um, a few minutes go by, and then she messages me back and says, like, oh, she, hasn't, she wasn't even sure if the current people were gone yet. And I was like, oh, that's awkward. And then on top of that, she wasn't, she hadn't had time to clean yet. And that she would be done hopefully by 11 something or whatever. And I was like, well, I don't really want to stand here while you clean. That's just awkward. Even, even in a hotel, I don't just stand there while they're cleaning. Yeah, but you, you're willing there. to go to one of these places and stay in the house with the owner of the place. Well, I, mean, about I don't awkward. want to stand over her shoulder while she's right. like making the bed or I got the toilet. So I figured I would just leave. I needed to do, to do some shopping because, you know, the other benefit to Airbnb is it's a full home, so I can have food, I can cook, whatever. It's no big deal. Whereas in a hotel, I have to eat out, and even then, it's just cramped and overtly. I mean, she didn't seem to be very, very even, sick. Even that day, she was okay. running around the backyard. When was the day? When did she first get sick? Then 
she was already sick. She, she just wasn't that bad off. I didn't realize how bad it was, I guess, the, the Monday. Because like I said, she okay. was just congested and stuff. When was the trip to the hospital, though? Didn't you and Trisha? That was the next night. Okay, so now we're on Tuesday the 26th. I gotta, you got to keep me on my time because I'll get screwed up and then we'll, I'll confuse you or myself. All right, so Tuesday. Go to the to the hospital. Yes, and that's in whose car? Hers or yours? It's in hers. Okay, and hers is a little white. What is it? What's her car? It's a Dodge Neon. And that's the one we see in the videos with the hubcap or whatever it is, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, whose car did you go in? Hers or yours? It's her car. Her car. That that's on Tuesday to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And what time do you guys leave the hospital? Do you do you remember? It, I have no idea what time it was. I don't even know what time we went to the hospital. I just remember afternoon, morning, well, it was in the evening. I just don't remember time. I, I, I wasn't referencing everything. I didn't look at a clock before I did it. I just, yeah, I got it beforehand. I was trying to debate with her about going. I was like, we don't need to go because you just gave her some children's time and all. Let's wait. Okay. You know, if you did give it to her, wait an hour or so or whatever, wait a little longer to see if it has any effect because how else would you know? Is she kind of, uh, you ever hear the term helicopter parent? And a helicopter parent is? No, I don't. Somebody, know. you should know. Come on, man. You're the aircraft guy. It's a parent who kind of hovers over their kids and is very protective and very involved and probably yeah. much so overly yeah. so. Yes and no, because was the more protective that was more cautious with her. Um, okay. You know, we would, uh, and she's capable of walking. And Trisha is, you know, like to that one who was all the way over here playing in the water and I'm like standing in between and I'm like looking at her like what are you doing it's like oh I'm sending a message in the waves like she couldn't swim right she's one she doesn't understand waves if yeah. she, like, one comes in and she can't she obviously will be able to time like there she goes and I'm thinking like are you kidding me so I yeah. pick her up and I bring her back you know to the shore where she's not going to get sucked into the ocean or whatever right but it was just always like I was always the more cautious parent where she kind of just had that laissez-faire was it it'll, it'll be okay kind of thing mm -hmm. like you can't do that things happen so better no no uh, she was still really lethargic very quiet um she didn't really talk or communicate much she just uh, she just wasn't herself she, you know she just kind of sat there um she wouldn't even really answer you when you asked her questions okay the that is that the night then the as we talk about the evening of the 26th after the hospital is that the night that trisha comes over to your the place you're staying at this is all the same day well it's two different days she came over monday night as well though okay but monday night was after i texted her and i said hey, oops, I, okay. toys. I don't have anything i don't have any way to entertain her other than television and I don't want to sit there and just pop her in front of the TV all day. That's just silly. Okay. You know, I didn't even have like coloring books. So she says, okay, when I get off work, I'll bring you some. And I thought, great, they bring me some toys, not a big deal. And when she came over, she brought like a bucket that had a bunch of toys in it. I was like, perfect. And she stayed and talked and talked about her possible love interest and all that. And I'm thinking, how did that make you feel? Here, the detective is attempting to find a possible motive. Is it money related? We're out of jealousy that your ex-wife is now interested in a new man. I didn't care. I just, this is the puppet dude you were talking about? I didn't know that that was the guy that <laughs> she was supposedly into. I, I had no idea who that guy even was. I mean, this um, is, we're, we're talking about, you're, I mean, you're, I assume you were not jealous of whatever was to going on in her life. You had your own life, you were moving your own direction, exactly. right? And the I only tie you had to her at this point in time was a, a number of financial obligations you had with I've never even be a floor. Right. Okay. All right. So, okay. So that's the 25th. The night of the 26th, after you got to the hospital, you get home. How is it that you told me you guys went to the hospital in her car? Mm -hmm. You all go back to your place? Yes. And leaves? Yes. And you don't know what time that is? No. I didn't. Dark. I mean, it's, it was dark when we went to the hospital. I don't know yeah. what time that was. Right. Okay. I, well, when she's with me, I try to send her to bed around eight, but because all day she didn't do anything, we just sit and throw up. She didn't nap. She didn't, she just laid there. So she fell asleep on the way back from the hospital. Okay. Because we had to wake her up in the car seat when we got back. And I was like, well, crap, now she's, she's got a nap, you know, and it's whatever time at night, you know, 
and now she's you know got a second wind so to speak so she's pretty awake and uh when we, even when we left the hospital she was doing a lot better she had finished her first little thing of well, uh, gatorade and pediolite or whatever and so now she's rejuvenated and awake and i'm like well it's fine i'll hang out with her you know she'll be fine and then when she gets tired i'll just put her to bed whatever that's okay fine. but that's after She's yeah. kind of well, like, so, Trish, that's kind of my plan. I'll, I'll put her right. in bed. It's no big deal. But then she leaves. These two, you, so basically, this is like the third time you would have had contact with Trish when she leaves. If she brings the, the toys in, the third time is um, you guys go to the hospital. Okay. From the, her normal sitter, Denise. Okay, so it's only the second time. Mm -hmm. Any conflicts, any arguments, any disputes, any disagreements? They just, said, when we're face to face in right. person, she's very, she's not the same person. Basically, okay. she's very sweet and how are you and oh you okay. look nice today and you know, just complimenting me. Oh, it looks like you're going to the gym. That's nice. Oh, your outfit's very nice. You know, and it, it just kind of put me off. Like, what do you? Why? Like, I would never compliment you. Like, not to be rude, but I, I'm not going to compliment. you. Be putting on a show in the presence of your child. I mean, that maybe. Okay. And, and I remember telling what well, my mom about it, and my mom told Trish, and I was like, "Well, that's all my mom did anymore." What? What? Then, how is it that that it is that Trish comes to be back at the I keep calling the bed and breakfast, the B and B thing, or whatever it is? Because when she got tired, she said, "Where's mommy?" Yeah. And I told her, "Mommy's at her house." And she says, "Well, I want mommy." I said, well, mommy, we'll see you tomorrow. Or, you know, I'll take you to mommy's house tomorrow. Just trying to help her understand, like, you know, it's just me and you, you're fine. And she just kind of kept saying, I want mommy. And I'm thinking, well, I guess I get it. You did just see the both of us together. And in the past, Trish had mentioned that, once again, via Skype, she, you know, pictures of us together. And, you know, she wanted to keep this photo out of the two of us. And I was like, well, yeah, it'd be a little awkward. I'd be why you wouldn't, you know, the photo of the two of us together. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, I guess that makes sense. You know, you saw us together. This is, you know, I guess kids naturally want their mommy and their daddy to be in the same place. Um, so I told Trish, which once again, in the past, she let me know, yeah. I'll come get her. And in the past, we are like right down the street. So I'll just message her and you can just come get her and then she'll be happy. So your plan was to have home with her? Then yes, if she was just gonna be up and antsy, then yeah, you could just take her and go back home. But I still wanted to spend time with her the next day because I wasn't leaving till that afternoon. Yeah, but I mean, like you're the you're her dad. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you just say, look, you know, mommy's doing her thing. You get to spend some time with me, and why bring Trisha back over? I mean, just it seems to me the last person you want to have any dealings with when you're down here with your daughter is your ex-wife. Well, to me. And I, okay. to me, I thought, who am I to deny my daughter her mother? I'm not going to tell you, no, go to bed. You know, like, it's your mom. You know, okay, mom. so we know exactly what time that text is, and that's at what? 12.08. 12 12.08. So we're now we're into Wednesday, just so we know we're all on the, on the same days. We're on 427 Wednesday. Okay. So when she comes over, what happens? What are you all doing? She comes over, um, she comes over on the couch, and so she rushes over and sits with her, and she picks her up, and they're watching the show that was And they sit together on the couch, and they talk, and just, I don't know, just whatever, mom, daughter, like, they just sit together, you know? Okay. And, uh, she's just holding her and sitting on the couch. Okay, so let's stop here for a moment. Let's stop on April 27th, 12 something in the morning you got breakfast place and the last time i heard anything about this case the last time i had been briefed on anything that happened in this case was <clears throat> three weeks ago mm -hmm. when everything happened and you were cooperating with law enforcement and you told them what happened from the 28 the 27th uh what what did you tell them? Because that what what I heard today is not the same as what you told them. What did you tell them the first time you spoke to the cops about what happened that day? I didn't tell them about her wanting me to go get her laptop. But well, I, okay, but what did you tell them that she just hung out there for a while and and was out of gas or something? Tell me about that. I told them that she came to meet her here. Okay, like, great, because I still want to spend time with her. And then I said that she left. And that's when she discovered she didn't have gas. Okay, so you told them that she went out, got her, got to her car, 
didn't have gas, and then what came back? Yes. And then you did what? And then I went around looking for gas through the home. Okay. The gas can. And the guy next door, the, the Chinese fella or, or Japanese or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you spoke with him trying to get a gas can from him, that guy, right? Yes. Okay. Did you know, I mean, did you see him over there? Could you see him from where you were standing? Because he saw you all night. He could see you coming and going or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if, obviously, you must have been able to see him because you went over and asked him for a gas can. I, no, I didn't see him. How I, did you know to go over there and ask for a can? Uh, I heard his phone. Okay. He was... I don't know if he was playing a game or messaging someone gotcha. or something like that. And when I was standing outside, I heard the phone. And I was like, well, perfect. If someone's awake, I can ask them for a gas can. Because obviously, I'm not going to knock on random people's doors at whatever time right. it is. <laughs> ask for a gas can. But if you're awake and you're outside on your porch, okay, sure, I can approach you and hopefully ask for a gas can. Right. And he didn't speak English, right? They had to bring somebody no. in to interpret for you? Right. And I There's, assume you don't speak. I don't. I didn't know what language it was, <laughs> okay. obviously. But, All right. yeah, a woman comes from inside. Yeah, he tells me to hold on, and a woman comes from inside. He has no gas, so my understanding is then you got in your car with the can, went off and got her a couple of gallons of gas and whatever, right? I had to purchase it, but yeah. Okay, right, well, right. Yeah. All right, and you, at that time, the video reflects what you were wearing. Do you remember what you were wearing? Yeah, it was just the same thing I've been sleeping in every night already. It was just a red shirt and some shorts, just because okay. they're, they're comfy. Okay. okay, all right. Um, so then you go back, then your story is what after you get the gas? Then I go back and have the gas in the car. And then what? And then she leaves. Okay. All right. And now, so that's, then that was the last time you saw from her, heard from her, had any knowledge of it. That was your story, right? Yes. The detective mentioned several times that he, unlike the other detectives, wasn't fully educated on the case. However, at times, he can be seen asking challenging questions, hoping to stump Stephen, as it is obvious that his story is a lie. Luckily for Stephen, he seemed to be navigating through them well. However, that didn't last as long as he expected. Now, what I asked them to do to make sure is, look, you gotta go back up, you gotta talk to Mr. Williams, we gotta make sure we got these time frames down, you gotta make sure that, and you consistently told that story exactly that way, multiple multiple times right yes okay and so then today i was surprised when they called me and said you know there's some additional stuff that he's adding on so let's talk a little bit about that because that's it doesn't make sense <laughs> you know it just doesn't make sense and you understand that i've heard you say in here multiple times you know how this is stupid stupid this stupid that doesn't make any sense so i want you and i to make sense of this while we have an opportunity okay so now walk me through, Trisha shows up sometime after 12.08, Wednesday, April 27th, 2016. Walk me through that day, walk me through the events. All that happens, she sits there, they sit together, they talk and do, you know, mommy, daughter things. I don't sit with them because once again, she's my ex-wife and I don't, I don't have feelings for her in that way. I don't wanna be rubbing shoulders with her, so to speak, you know? So I just kind of stand off and just let her ask me to go get her laptop. And I'm telling her, like, that's stupid. Why would I go get your laptop? And she just kind of kept saying, well, she falls asleep soon, and then I can still do stuff with her. Otherwise, I got to go pick her up in the morning. And it's just more, it's just more work. And so I didn't want to argue anymore. I never liked arguing with her. And I just, I just caved and said, fine. I, I'm, dude, I'm so with you on this whole, don't make that, go get my laptop. I could envision having this conversation with my wife. What are you talking about? Why? What did she need the laptop for? That's what she just kept saying work. And even earlier that night when she had it at the hospital, she just kept saying, like, I got to send an email for work. And she just kept saying it over and over, like, I'm supposed to know what that means. Or one email or multiple emails? Well, I mean, did it make? I, even at the hospital, I'm like, we're at the hospital with our two year old. Let me bring your laptop in <clears> to <throat> do work. And I'm thinking that couldn't wait, but. Once again, I don't care. If that's what you're gonna do, that's what you're gonna do. I've just learned, don't just let it be. Um, which laptop was the one she had in the car already? I don't know. I just know she asked me to go get her work laptop. Okay. And the one she had at the hospital was a black. I don't know what it was, it was black. Did she have more than one laptop? As far as I knew, yeah, because okay. that, if, if she was calling that black on her work laptop, then I remember when we separated, she had, a, it used to be my old laptop. It's a silver, I don't know if it was a Dell or HP or something, but she had another laptop. That, okay. You know, that's what we usually Skype on. All right, but so, I mean, 
I get this impression from you that you're this kind of laid back, non confrontational, chilled guy. So I try to be good. Just... But how, I mean, you know, like, what in the hell do you need a laptop for? Are you no, see, I, I just... mean, just because, okay. like I said, after 11 years and right. before, I just... What it is, is she beat it. you down? Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. Okay. I didn't want all the nonsense from the past. I was just like, you know what? Fine. It's that important. Where was the laptop? She told me it was at home. Okay. And where she, where was she living? From, once again, prior weeks before or whatever, she had told me, like, hey, in accordance with the... Okay, I don't know okay. what's important, but what are you, what are you telling me? She's like, oh, well, this is our new address or okay. that we moved. And I was like, well, what's the address, please? And then she waited forever and had to remind her, like, hey, what's this address? And you, and prior to the day, prior to the morning of April 27th, have you ever been to that new address of hers? Yes. Okay. I knew, I didn't know when I saw the numbers, but I looked it up to see where that even was. You know, okay. She originally gave it to me and I saw where it was. I was like, oh, that's where Josh was living. So I took it as Josh moved out and you moved in. Josh, her brother? Yes. Okay. But after seeing Skype, I see that Josh was always there okay. in the background or talking or something like that. And so if almost every day of the week this person is there, it tells me he still lives there. You know, and I didn't really question it. Once again, not my place. It's not my business. How did you, know? you plan on getting the laptop from the house? Before? Exactly. That's why I was like, this is a stupid idea. Like, I don't even know if he's here. I don't know what his schedule is like. If he is, what do I tell him? Oh, well, your your sister, my ex-wife, told me at whatever time it is to come and get her work laptop. Why didn't you just bring bring her up? Why didn't you? I didn't even call bring my phone. I didn't bring my phone. I just you I didn't, didn't bring your even, telephone, right? I well, but I'm saying from the from the bread bed and breakfast, why not call Josh and say, "Look, your sister's on my ass. She wants her laptop. I'm running by. Can you just have it ready?" I don't even have his number. I didn't know if he was even there. I didn't know anything other than she. Well, but she would have had it, right? Yeah, but it might, I didn't think like that. Okay, it was fine. just, okay. I don't want to argue. I'll just go get it. You know, okay. I, just, I caved. I'll just go get it. Okay, so you're driving in that direct. What car do you take? I take hers. Okay, and what did you just basically figure you're going to roll up there and knock on the door and say, Yo, Josh, it's, well, I mean, it's, it's me, I Steven? I to the car, so I bet I'll just use the key if I needed to. But okay. Again, I don't even know if you Why he's did there you take her car? Why would you have taken her car? Because her car is blocking my car. Okay, where was her car parked? It's. It's just the driveway, so she just pulled in. Okay, so she, your car is in front, and then she's right behind you? Yes. Okay. All right, makes sense. So you back out your drive there, and, and... I get, like, I assumed halfway there or something, and I just decided this is stupid. This doesn't make sense. I don't even know if he is here. What do I say to him? If he's not here, this is still really awkward. And then I'm like, I don't even know where it is in the home. Like, I'm just going to rummage through this place to find some work. But yeah. all of it just seemed really dumb to me and, like, bad. And so I just turned around. And at that point is when I realized this car has next to no gas. Like, Okay, so that's when we got the, your cars on video out in front of where? What's the name of the place, Jess? When it's turning around? Stoney's. Stoney's. Do you know what Stoney's is? No. Okay, but is that, there's the white car without the hubcap that does a U-turn there. That's going to be you having the epiphany, what the hell am I going to do? I can't get this laptop and going back. Well, like, I probably could have, but that just, just from past instances with her, all I'm thinking is this doesn't make sense. This feels really dumb. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like I'm making a grave error by even being out here right now. Like, it doesn't. Well, I mean, I think you're being, you're being a little dramatic. I mean, not grave error, but well, it's, it's just, it just it's felt, a stupid idea is what you're right. saying. Right. It's like, okay. this doesn't make sense to come get this laptop now. You should, I should have stood my ground and told her to just wait. And, but I did, you know, I just didn't want to argue because I'd never like arguing with her. And I, right. just, I just, okay. came. so I was like, you know what? This is dumb. I'm going back. She can so just, now you're doing the, the Louis or you're doing the U-turn and heading back to your place. And that's when you say you notice her her car is low on gas? Yeah, that's when I'm looking, because I made a U-turn. Yeah, but I mean, wouldn't, the, shouldn't that light have come on a long time before? I did her classic thing where I didn't pay attention. I just, I was just, like, annoyed, and I just got in the car, and I just drove. Okay. And it wasn't until making the U-turn that I'm really... You saw it. This now, thing is almost yeah, gas. So, so here's the, you know, I, I try to live in a logical world that makes sense. And I, you strike, basically, you have an engineer's type mind. You'd like everything to be perfect. I mean, when you're working on an airplane, you don't say, well, it looks like this part goes here, right? right? I mean, it goes there. And if you put the wrong part in the wrong place, 
planes crash, people die. We can't have that, right? Right. So, you know, things have to be in order and they have to make sense. They have to be logical. The first thing that popped in my mind when I heard this change in your story, adding in the, the, the going to get the laptop thing is, why don't you get the gas right then? Why are, why are we going through all of these motions to go search for a gas can? Uh, I didn't want to pay for the gas. And, and, and that's, another, just, that's another theme I, you and I keep having. This money, you money, money, money. You keep talking about money. I mean, what are we talking about? Four bucks? For me, it, was, it wasn't just the fact that it's four dollars. It's like the principle that I shouldn't have to put gas in your car. Like we're not together. Just like I shouldn't have to pay for your cell phone if we're not right. together. I shouldn't. You know, I shouldn't have to do these things for you. Like getting the laptop, I shouldn't even be doing. But you're not. Laptop. You're not. Here's the problem with that, Steve. Is you're really not doing it for her. You're kind of doing it for faith. Like I heard what you said was, look, I'm going to put that get a little gas can, put it in there next time because she's toting my daughter around. She'll have a can in the car. Right. You know what I mean? So she can maybe get gas or whatever. So really. Thing is, I'm annoyed by the whole situation. The last thing I'm going to do is spend any money on you to put gas in your car. All right. So I just drive it back and then I tell her like, you need to put gas in your car. And we talk about like, you know, why you don't have gas or whatever. And she tells me I was gonna get gas in the morning and just the same stuff I've heard before. All right, but so at that point in time now, you get back, you don't have a laptop. That couldn't have gone over very well. Well, I explained why I didn't go get it. And yeah, she didn't, I mean, she wasn't very happy, but once again, what I think the gas, I told her the gas took more precedence basically. But you didn't know about the gas until after you'd abandoned the laptop well, on the way project. Back. Yes. And that's yeah. what I told you. Know, As so I come back, she'd ask, like, you know, if you don't have a laptop. And I told her, like, yeah, I didn't go get it. And you don't have any gas. Did car. she get hot? Did that get heated? I mean, did she get upset? No, I think she just kind of, like, realized it was a stupid errand to go on anyway. Because, like I said, I didn't really argue it very much. But at the same time, my whole premise was this is why. Like, it can wait. The detective's challenging questions are starting to get more and more noticeable to Stephen. At this point, the detective's pure motive is to prove to Stephen that his story is what's actually stupid and doesn't make any sense. Well, remember, all this is, you know this is recorded. Obviously, you're a smart cop. And the reason we do that is for your protection and for ours, so that we can't be said that we did or said anything that isn't recorded for all time's sake. You're on video telling these guys that you did that, that you left her in front of the house at your brother's, right? Yes. That's a lie. Yes. What kind of people lie? Innocent people or guilty people? Guilty. Yeah. And so why did you lie about that? I mean, so look, I, I'd like to keep track because the first of all, we have, I can't tell you how many lies you would have told because every time there's a lie by omission too, by not mentioning something. Every time you told them about how this incident went down right after Trisha's disappearance, you left out the whole laptop thing, not to mention all of this other stuff. So those were all lies. Um, now you lied to them later on about returning to her house. Why are you lie? Why are you? Tell me why you lied. Because all of it looks bad. Right. I it makes it looks much worse when you lie. I just it's, wanted to leave her home and then be done. Mr. Williams, when the jury watches this videotape, and what they see is a continual, constant evolution, and then lies in that evolution of the story. They're going to get somewhat suspicious. It's going to create some concern in their mind that you did something wrong. You, you, would you agree with that? No, I just wanted, I didn't have a plan. I, I didn't know what to do. All I wanted was just to be done with this night. I but just, then that's what, the very first time you met with them, you should have said, this is the, this is what happened. I didn't know what to do. I had no plan. I, this is crazy. I don't know how to explain it, but you lied when you first talked with them, didn't you? Yes. And then you lied again to them yesterday when you talked to them initially for a while, right? Yes. And then when your story started changing, you lied even in your new story because it's changing to, to from yesterday to today, right? No. That you took her and left her in the car in front of her trailer. You told them that, right? Yes. And that was a lie. So that's a change, right? Yes. Okay. So I just want to, you and I are on a road now. And this road, I promise you, will end at the truth. Throughout this interrogation, it can be evident that this detective is blunt. So much so that he admits to Stephen that he does not believe his story. Often, detectives avoid doing so to provide a sense of security to the suspect which would help reveal the truth. But Stephen did not buy into it, and the detective was aware of it. 
However, the next detective can be seen using a different technique, and the interrogation takes a very unexpected turn. Here you go. Thanks. Uh, all right, listen, I want, to, I want to kind of talk to you about what's going on with this, okay? And I've been involved with this case from the beginning, okay? And I've seen everything that we have. I've seen all the interviews. And at this point, I know we've come in and we talk to you over and over and over again. We've talked to you in Rolling. We've talked to you here. And we've always talked about the past. What happened that night? What happened that night? What happened that night? What I want to do is I want to kind of talk to you about the future where we're going from here. Okay. Now, I'm, you, you've already heard about all the stuff that we got. I mean, there's no question about what happened that night. We know that it's more than you're telling us. We know that you were involved with with her death. We know that, okay? So the question is not what happened or anything like that. What we need to understand is going forward, okay, there's gonna be a trial, okay? There's gonna be uh, press. There's gonna be everybody looking at this. You've seen how these things, they get huge. The media gets involved and everybody's gonna have an opinion about what happened. And everybody's going to have an opinion about you and your relationship and what kind of person you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, that we're trying to do here is, I, I mean, I talked to you earlier. You're a nice guy. I like you. I mean, I think we could be friends, you know, in different circumstances. But here's the thing. The detective is attempting to build a connection with Stephen to provide him with an atmosphere to be open and candid. You know, there's going to be two narratives going forward. Okay. And what I want to do is try to give you the opportunity to kind of tell me more about what narrative actually happened, okay? So what, what we're looking at is, you know, there, there's the one option, okay? And that's the option that you were kind of getting from earlier when, when Tom was in here, which is, you know, you, you planned this? You came down here with the intent purpose to, to hurt Trisha? That you were going to, that you planned to ditch her car here in some calculated way and that you planned to go put her in a certain place that she, nobody could find her and all that kind of stuff? And, and that sounds pretty bad, right? I mean, that's, I mean, you wouldn't agree with that, okay? Nice. Now, the, the other alternative is that, and like I said, we, we know what happened. We know that, you know, that something beyond what you were telling us happened in the house. But I think the more likely story is having seen, I mean, trust me, I've been here, you haven't seen me before involved in this, but I've seen you, okay? I've done a lot of research in your background. And I know what it was like with Trisha. I know what kind of stuff you went through. I know she had a wild streak when she was younger. I know what she did. And she came after you, you know, in that, that domestic thing that happened before. I know how that started, okay? I, we've seen the reports. We know how it all happened. We know she went back and said, no, the whole thing was made up because she started it, okay? What I think is a more, to me, having known you, having known the background of everything between you and her, everybody's going to have their own opinion. But... I can see that I think probably what happened was something more like she started something that night. Okay. The detective is tailoring his words according to what Stephen would find favorable to listen to. This is to help gain his trust, so he ends up convinced that this detective would understand his actions. And, uh, you know, having known what her background was, having known how she treats you, okay, I've seen text messages, I've seen how what she says to you. Okay, I know what kind of stuff she, she's always bitching you about stuff. I get that. I see that. Okay, so I can see how that would kind of go that direction that night. All right. So what I want to do is try to try to set the set the stage so that you can actually tell the narrative about what actually happened, which is not that you planned all this. Okay, not that you planned down here to come down here and kill her and send her out in the woods like some sort of mass murderer. I mean, really? I mean, like, like you're going to chop her up in a little bits or something like that? I mean, that, that seems kind of ridiculous, okay? It seems far-fetched, like you said, okay? And I don't think you planned all this. I don't think you're capable of that, okay? I think what happens is sometimes things just get out of hand, okay? You'd agree with that? Sometimes, you know, people start doing something, and, and they cause something to happen, okay? And I'm not saying you wanted this to happen. All right. But I know you were there when it happened. OK, what we want to understand is what actually happened that night. OK, and I know you were there and I know I don't believe it was your fault. 
okay? So what I imagine something to be, you know, is maybe you guys got an argument. Maybe it was over the computer. Maybe it was over the gas. Maybe it was over whatever, okay? Any little nitpicky thing that she's going to get on you about, which she always did. I get that, okay? And things got heated, okay? You're down here to try to see your daughter, okay? You're a good dad. You're trying to be down here to spend time with with somebody that you care about, your daughter. And Trish is here again, you know, and unfortunately, I'm sure that doesn't make you feel that good. She's spending, she's trying to spend time with your daughter, okay? It's okay. It's but, but it's, you know, and Trisha came over, but then things started getting kind of ugly. The detective is narrating the story as if he were an eyewitness to the incident, but in reality, he's strategically shaping the narrative to favor Stephen employing this tactic as, yet again, another means of building trust and encouraging Stephen to disclose what truly transpired. Okay, and I'm sure she started that. And you didn't want to get involved in that, okay? But if she starts pushing things, she's not going to back up. She, she's, she's unrelenting, okay? I've seen this, okay? I've seen the history. I've seen the background of how this works, okay? So what, what I could see happening is that maybe... She came at you and, I mean, just defending yourself, she falls. Maybe um, you, you didn't realize how hard you pushed her out of the way, but you're just trying to defend yourself. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying that you tried to hurt her, but I'm saying that it's clear that something happened there and that resulted in Trisha getting injured to the point where she, where she was deceased. Okay. And then beyond that, I can see you know, putting myself in your shoes for a minute. Okay. I see that you're, you're a hard worker. Okay. You've, you've grown to the ranks. You're in the Air Force. You've been there, what, 11, 12 years, you said? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a long time. That's a career. You've devoted your life to, to that career, to this country. Okay. You've got your daughter to think about. Okay. Something happened. It's Trisha's own fault. Now she's gone. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. But what do you people aren't going to believe that, that you weren't, you know, planning to do this. People aren't going to believe that you weren't intending to hurt her in some way. But sometimes shit just happens. And now here it is. So now you've got to make a choice. OK, do you call the cops and roll the dice that we're going to believe your story? Or do you try to do the you, you go into a little bit of panic mode? And trust me, if I was in the same, I don't know what I would have done. OK, I couldn't even imagine being in that position, but I can understand going into that, that panic mode of, holy shit, what do I need to do now? And so your first plan, I mean, you told us that you, your plan was that you were just going to take her back to the house and you were going to leave her there, which I understand because she's going to be back by her house and people are going to find her and, you know, then maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll look other where other places. You know what I mean? And, and I understand that, okay? And that's what you told us. That was that was kind of your first thought. But that's probably when you saw that Joshua was still home. So, and and now you're not going to run the risk of him coming out when when this is all going on. Because, I mean, that's, that's not going to work well for you at all, right? I mean, if Joshua comes out and sees all this, he's not going to understand. He's obviously going to think that you planned this and did this intentionally. So, so now we're going to go back to the house. Okay. And of course, Trisha, being the way she is, there's no gas in the car. Typical Trisha. And I keep, I mean, come on. I mean, how, how much, how hard is it to go fill up a gas tank? I mean, really? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. You got to think ahead about this type of stuff. I never let my gas, my gas tank go below a quarter of a tank. That's me, you know, but I pay attention to that stuff. My wife should run that gas tank out all the time. And the next thing you know, I got to go out in the middle of the night because I got to run and get groceries or something. I'm also getting gas because she didn't think ahead about it. He uses personal experience to convey a further understanding of Stephen's frustrations. Now, while his personal experiences may not be true, this strategic approach is an attempt to break through Stephen's resistance to reveal the truth. Okay. So, so now, well, obviously, you can't go to the gas tank, the gas station in her car because. She's in the car. That's not going to look good, right? So you head back to the house, and you do the only thing you can think of is, is hopefully somebody has some gas there, right? And we, we confirmed that. We talked to everybody. And yeah, you did. You tried to get some gas at the house. And then 
you decide that you're just going to have to go get gas, but now you're going to take your own car, obviously, because you don't want to be in her car. So, I mean, that's all confirmed, and that, and that makes perfect sense. Okay. So, and then now you're going to have to go to plan B, which is, unfortunately, you're going to have to take her somewhere else because you can't risk somebody seeing you with, with her in the car, right? Because that's going to be too hard to explain. And it is, and now we're in this position. It's very difficult to explain, and I get that. But what we need to do is is moving forward. I mean, is is and like I said, it's, it's it's these two narratives. Okay, we need to understand now what happened because we we're going to write reports about this. This is all on video. This is all going to go forward into this trial. This is inevitable. We, I can't change this at this point. This is a roll. This is a boulder rolling down a hill. Okay, the only thing I can do is alter the course slightly. And the only thing that I can do at this point, and like I said, I think you're a good guy. I've talked to you. You're a nice guy. Okay. I don't think that you were a cold-blooded killer who came down here with the explicit intention to murder her. Okay. I don't think that's the case. Okay. But right now, I, I can't say otherwise. I can't say that there was an accident because you're not telling us something other than that. Okay. We have all this evidence, and then we also have things that are not consistent, okay? We're having inconsistencies where there's still holes, even after all of this, there's still holes in the story that we can prove through evidence that what you're telling us is not completely true. And that continues to make it look like even having understanding that this, this has happened and it was out of your control and we know what happened, you're still trying to tell us little lies about what happened so that it makes you look better. And unfortunately, that's that's not going to help you because any lie at this point is going to make you look bad. And it's going to tip that boulder right back to the, everybody thinking, oh, well, he's a liar. He's a cold-blooded murderer. He came down here to kill her. And they're going to put you on, you know, like these posters with all these, you know, serial killers and stuff like that. That's not where you need to be, okay? Sometimes people just make mistakes. Sometimes accidents happen. Sometimes things get out of control. And that's understandable, but you have to tell us that story. We have to understand what happened so that we can tell that story. Because once I, once we're done here, we don't make any more recordings. We don't write more reports. Once I put in my report, whatever happened, that's, that's set in stone because that's what you told me. Whatever your words are, that's what we can, that's what we take to court. That's going forward. What you told us about what happened. That's what you told us. Uh, the truth was, okay? And if we come back and show that, hey, that's not, then again, that just looks horrible for you. And that starts telling that other narrative, all right? So I think that you were there when she was injured and that she was injured in some way that was not a direct attack from you but I think that you have more information about what actually happened to her because I know you were in the house with her when it happened. Is that true? No. Been there really day. Okay. No, listen, we, I know, and you tell me that, okay. And you're using very specific language. So tell me, I'm not saying that you laid a hand on her, but I know that you were there when she was injured. So you need to explain to us how it was she, be, she became injured because because this whole thing where you came back from the gas station and you just found her like that, I know that's not true. I, and I can prove that's not true. Okay? And I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be locked into this story where you're telling us a lie about how she became injured. Because if you lie about how she became injured to me right now, then that makes it look like you did it on purpose. Of course not. And, well, and that's not the story that I want to tell. Okay? And I want you to be able to tell the story about what actually happened and for the truth to get out there. The only thing that's going to help you at this point is the truth. And, and I know that the truth is not that you came home and you found her after you went to go get gas for her. I know that's not the truth. Okay. And I need you to tell us the truth so that I can tell the actual truth when we go to court. Cause that's what I'm here for. I'm here to find out the truth about what happened. I'm not, I'm not here to try you. I'm not a jury. I'm not a judge. I'm not a lawyer. Okay. I'm a detective. A detective's my sole job is to find the truth about what happened. Because once I'm done with my job, I can write the truth in my report and I can be satisfied that I understand the entire truth. But if there's something that doesn't add up, if there's something that I know to be a lie, 
I have to keep digging at it. And I keep digging at it and keep digging at it. And I have to bring that up in court because they're going to ask me, is this the whole truth? Is this what actually happened? And I'm going to have to say, I have evidence contrary to that. I know that that's not what happened. And I know he's lying. Okay. But the only person who was in that house who can tell us what happened to Trisha is you. Can't tell us what happened. But if you don't tell us the truth about what happened, it just continues to make it look like you're lying to us to cover up something more sinister, for lack of a better word. Like you intended this to happen, and now you're covering it up. And I don't want that to be the story. It's not the story. And I know. And that's why I want you to have this opportunity to tell me the the truth about how she became injured, how that how Trisha lost her life. Yeah, you 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 do. You do, you do. Okay. And I know that you were in the house. Like I said, do I can I can prove but I didn't do anything to her. And I you're not you're not hearing me. Okay, you're not hearing me. Okay. I'm not saying that you did anything to her on purpose. I'm not saying that you hurt her. I'm not saying that you laid hands on her. Okay. But I do know that you know what happened to her. I know that you know you what happened to her. I know you were in I know you were in the house. I know it. Okay. And I can prove that. And I don't want to have to get up on the court and on the, on the jury in the, in the stand and explain to the jury that even after giving the opportunity to tell me the truth about what happened, to, to tell me the truth that you're not this cold blooded murderer who came down here to kill her. I never do that. It, you can tell me that, but you continue to tell me a lie about what happened. You continue to tell me a lie about how you found her dead how she came to be injured like that. You, and I know, I don't want that to be the last thing that we hear about this. I don't want the last thing that you're able to tell us is this lie about how she got hurt because that is the most important piece of this. There's no question that she was killed. There's no question that she was taken out into the, the woods. But the problem is that the narrative is, was that the actions of someone who was panicking and a jury yes. could completely understand this. I did. I didn't know what to do. I, but, don't, I don't. So plan. So things. explain I to me. Know I, how, I don't know what you do in these situations. And I know you didn't plan this. And that's exactly what I'm saying. That's why I'm trying to give you the opportunity to explain to us how it happened. That it because it was not planned. You did not no. attack her. You did no. not try Never. to kill her or try to come down here to kill her. Never. But things happen. And I, we need to understand what it was that happened in that house be before the whole gas thing. I know it happened before the gas thing. I know it happened before you went for the, this computer thing. I, I know that's not the truth. I can, I can prove that this is not the truth. I need to know the truth to, to be able to tell people that, that you're not a serial killer, that you're some yeah. psychopath who has no remorse over killing the mother of your child. But you know that's what's going to be in the paper. You know that's I what's going to change that. You can. You can change that. that. Can you can change that right that. now. No, I yes, can't. you can. Yes, I you can't can. tell you anything other than what I've told you. No, you can tell and, me the truth. And that's the problem. And nothing, I, nothing, nothing makes it better. Nothing I say makes this better. Yeah, it will. And because it doesn't matter. Because there's a huge difference between we got an argument, it got physical, she started it, she got hurt. That that's not that's, that's, any better. That's, that's no, no better. No, tell me. That's the same scenario. That she is still, miles, that is miles better than I came down here with a backpack, with a backpack full of tools, ready to kill her and drag her out with her lifeless body into the woods. It was just clothes. It was just the clothes that didn't fit. You heard, you heard the narrative that you told. But it was you told just, you told us more I had a bag, I had clothes, yes. I had water, yes. I had Not snacks in there. Well, no. I'm saying you got the bag, and then after all of this is done, all this messy business is finished. Now you get rid of that. That looks awful that looks like that looks like that. a murder bag that looks that, like oh my gosh she came down here what with was. this bag and i don't think it was i think it was just a bag it, that's that you had was. with some stuff in it yes that's but you literally need, what it was just but you need to explain stuff that i already had but if that's the case you need to explain the how she got hurt in this interrogation stephen has used a total of two tones a monotone, when he tries to paint himself as the calm, non-confrontational ex-husband, 
and a defensive tone when he gets frustrated with the detective for not believing his futile lies. It's comical when a grown man acts this way. I know that your plan was not, I mean, you, I mean, how ridiculous is that? You plan to have a sick child? You plan to have your child call for the mother in the you middle of the night? Plan to take a stupid trip to the hospital? But people are no. going to believe that if you let them. They're how, gonna how do you plan you, you, how do you so, plan for your child to be sick in the so, middle of the night? So I know you, you think don't. that the truth is going to sound worse, but you know it's not. You know it's not going to sound worse. You know it can't be worse than this narrative that people are creating about you. It's only that people are already saying everything this. else already. I've already told too many different freaking versions. You told you told versions because you panicked. Because you were scared. People can understand that. Scared. People can understand that. But at a certain point, you have to realize because you're afraid. I'm going to you're afraid I'm going that you're going to get prison for caught. You're going to get blamed. You're going to get. You're going to get in trouble, but I can tell you right now, we're there. We're there. Okay, you're you're here with us, not be, because of what happened, and we need to understand the truth about what happened. Because I know you're scared. I know you're scared about what's going to happen in the future. But before you were panicking because you didn't want anybody to know you were involved. You didn't want anybody to know you were there. You wanted it to go away. Oh, that wanted. that is a normal human response. That's what anybody would do in that situation. That you're panicking. You're panicking. That's that's a that's a that's a reasonable that's a reasonable thought process that people can understand. But what we can't get past is you continuing to, to lie about what happened. And I can't let you continue to lie about what happened. I need you to tell me the truth about what happened. I know you were there. I want to give you the opportunity to tell me what happened. I know you didn't, but you, you've got, you've got to clear this off you. I can see this is, this is not something you can carry around. It's, it's, it's not something that's, you can weigh, weigh, weigh you down for the rest of your life. Well, it's so many times to just say the truth or talk to a counselor and I didn't even know what I would tell them. I don't even know how to tell them. I don't know. And, and it's impossible for somebody who's outside to understand sometimes. But you you got to let us know the truth about what happened, so that you can move past this for yourself. You got to you got to wait, get this weight off of your shoulders because it's going to destroy you, and you can't you can't let that happen to yourself. You you've regardless of what happens from here, you still have a daughter. You are still a father. You still have somebody you're responsible for. Okay, no, and you can't you. In, At this point, I'm in one way, or another, I can't. I, no, that's not true. It's and, and 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 don't think that's the truth. Okay, I can't guarantee you what's going to happen. Okay, I, it's, it's not up to me. But what I can do is I can tell you that we need to know the truth. The truth about what happened. That everyone, the families, they need to know what happened because you cannot let everyone else make up some story? Do you want her to believe these stories that people are going to spin about you because you continue to lie to us about what happened that night? I know you were there. I know you know the truth. You need to tell us so that we can just put a pin in this and say, now we know the truth. It does. It does. It's going to. Because, because it cannot, it cannot get worse than what people make up. I tell you that I, you would not believe people's imagination. Well, you would, but I mean, people's imaginations will run wild, and they will come up with the most horrific things. I don't even know where to. It just just don't know. It just, just happened. Talk just talk happened. to me about from midnight. I would have never texted her otherwise. It was right. already late, and she had already left. I would have never texted. And her. you're a good dad, just, so you want to. Wanted. That's it. That's all I was trying to do was just be a good dad. Just okay. You want your mom? Fine. Like I'm not gonna deny you that. You know. Mm -hmm. So we'll so I don't just come by. That's fine. And then just, no, I never liked her around. I never liked being in one on one situation with her because I could never predict her. I don't know the version of her I'm getting at that moment. And so no, I never like being in a one on one situation just right. because 
just like now, there's only it's only in pop order or order or whatever. <laughs> you can't change how things freaking look. Right. So yeah, she came over talking about the nonsense and bringing up child support and just more stupid stuff that I just for the most part tried to ignore and then yeah there was a mix up with the check but that's not my fault because you told me this was your address so yeah that's where I mailed it to and then she's telling me that's not the mailing address it's just out of my mind. I don't like that's not my fault if you told me you moved I did the responsible thing and I made sure the check was going to go wherever you moved to if you're not at your mom's house and then she's just going on and on and on. Now I owe her more money and back child support. And just and I'm just sitting here like, then I'll fix it. I'll send you another. I'll do something. But I don't have the money now. So just give me some time. like Because that money, since you didn't get it on time, is already spent. I spent it to come here. And now I need a little more time to get it to you. And now she's talking about how she's going to go to court and all this other stuff. And it's my fault. And I'm just like... This isn't even my fault. Like, you told me you moved, so I adjusted it. Like, just calm down. Like, this isn't even that serious. This is an easily rectifiable, why are you getting all out of hand about this, you know? Right. And, and, and yeah, I know I didn't go through the court to pay child support, but every time I tried, it was just, she just stonewalled me. It's like, I don't want to do that because I have to pay money to send you money, which is stupid. I was like, just let me have your account information, just a, just the account number, and I'll direct deposit it, and this will never happen. And no, that was, that's not going to work, and we can't do that. You owe me all this money, and then she's going to go to court and make me pay you all the other money from the divorce that I already took over ten thousand, like twenty something thousand dollars in debt that I have to pay back in eighteen months, and then if I don't pay all that back, I got another six thousand dollars I got to pay as far as back child support so now she's trying to say i'm gonna have to pay all that back and then she just gets on my face about it and i'm like what why are you so mad right now like I, is it because i called you this late it just it just completely got out of hand and then just the whole pointing and the, the I just it just all went bad it just so fast she just went from zero to a hundred and i'm trying to understand like what just happened like you were just here earlier Everything was fine. You left. We're arguing about something that I'm sitting here thinking this is unbelievably trivial and this can be fixed. I can fix this by the first. Just give me time and I'll make sure you get the money or I'll make it in two separate payments or whatever you need me to do. And it's just not, it's just not good. It's not going to work. None of this works. And she eventually falls asleep anyway, but she's still like arguing with me over in the, the, the foyer area. And I'm just like, please just leave then just go no i'm not leaving until we fix this like just just get out like i don't i don't know what you want from me trisha i don't have any money for you i don't have any cash for you i can't give you anything right now i spent the little money i had which is why i drove here I didn't fly i didn't get a rental car like i normally do i'm not in a hotel well i don't want to do the hotel thing but i don't have money like mm -hmm. just I paid so much money to the debt but I don't have any more money, okay? I just don't. I am, like, pretty much strapped when it comes to cash. Living paycheck to paycheck, and even then, I'm not making it right now. And it's just, it's just, it doesn't matter. You owe me money. You need to pay your debts. This is always your fault. You're always spending more money. And it's just on and on and on to the point where now I'm just trying to, like, walk away. And now I can't walk away because you're circling me and, like, you're jumping in front of my face. And you just... It, it just got so aggressive and I'm just trying to back away and de-escalate and I can't even leave the house now. You know, I don't want to push you. I don't want to touch you. I don't want to anything with you because all I'm having, I'm just thinking about flashbacks of before when you just blew all this, this shit up for no reason. And then now I'm getting arrested, but only after the fact did you go and, you know, say that it wasn't my fault. No, no one else knows that now, but only after the fact that I got arrested, all I'm thinking just, and just flashbacks. So I moved. I go to push her away, and then she gets really pissed about that, and then she gets even more aggressive and in my face and pushing me back. And I'm like, "Would you please just stop? Like, I don't want. I don't want this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why you're so mad. I don't know if you, if you took a freaking crazy pill on the way over here, and that really pissed her off. And uh, it just, it just escalated. And then I just moved her away, and then she slipped. And that's when she freaking fell. And I'm like, oh, shit. I asked her if she was okay. It was like a weird sound. She didn't say anything, though. And then I freaking panicked. And then I, I just freaking panicked. Because I didn't read. I didn't try to hurt you. I just wanted you to stop being here in my face yelling at me as I'm trying to 
back away. I'm trying to de-escalate. I don't want whatever this is. It's not, it's not that serious. I don't know why it's so serious about this money. It's always been so like, even throughout the divorce, every penny has just been so serious about her trying to get every dollar. Right. And I'm like, and now I made a mistake and I sent the check to the wrong address because I didn't know that wasn't a mailing address. And I, I can't explain where it is. And I didn't even get it back in the mail until a week after that. And it, it just, it just went so fast. And then I pushed her. And then it didn't push, push. I was just trying to get her away. Just please stop yelling Some in my space. face. It's like, just, you know, like if she was at that distance, fine. But she wasn't. She's just right here the face. whole time. And I'm like, please just stop. And so I went to move her away. And she slipped. And she hit her head. And I didn't mean for that. That wasn't my freaking fault. I wasn't... And then all I'm thinking is, great, now I've pushed her and she's hurt her head and, and I'm done. I'm just, everything I've tried to do, everything I've tried to be is done because I've made a mistake. I didn't even really even lose my cool. I just tried to move you away. I just did Alas, Stephen finally confesses to what occurred before Trisha's life was tragically taken away. However, this is far from the truth as he makes it seem as if it was unintentional. Unfortunately, it was only proven more later on that this murder was a premeditated one. <laughs> I just tried to de-escalate the situation because I couldn't get out. I didn't know where to go. I couldn't even just leave. Like all I wanted to do was just leave. I just wanted nothing to do with that. Do you know what she hit her head on? Was it the floor or I don't know. It just, she just fell and then she just she wasn't responsive after that and I didn't know what the hell to do because <laughs> all I thought is if I call the police now I'm just going to say I freaking pushed her and I'm going to jail <laughs> so so what, were, what did you do next I tried. I like. I just tried to wake her. I tried to like snap her out of it, and it just it just kept getting worse. Just she just wasn't responding. She had, she made weird breathing sounds, and I'm thinking, oh shit, I'm going to jail. Like I'm going to jail killing this woman that I never wanted to hurt. Never. And I don't think you. Did. I never I wanted her to be her. I I never wished ill on her. I tried to always do right by her, no matter what the situation. I just tried. Do the right thing. And all I'm thinking is I'm going to jail for, for trying not to hurt you. <laughs> Knowing what we know now, Stephen's tears could not be mistaken for real tears of regret, as he had planned all along to take the life of his daughter's mother. However, despite his confession being far from the truth, it was huge progress, and the detectives at least had something to work with now. All that was left to find were the remains of Trisha, which would eventually help reveal whether her death was unintentional, as Stephen claimed, or it was intentional. But it wasn't as easy as expected. And that's, I mean, and that's, that's exactly why I wanted you to tell me the truth. <laughs> I just wanted to stop. I just wanted it to go away. I just wanted to just go back. I just... <laughs> okay. And 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 that I believe you. I believe everything that you just told me. Okay, Stephen. Doesn't make it matter. I, it does. It makes it makes a huge difference because that's that's what we need to do. We need to get to the truth about all. <laughs> now you know you know the next question I'm going to ask you. Okay, and I know you don't want to, don't but we need to know where Trisha know. is. I don't. Oh, and I, I really I don't, don't have a freaking clue where that was. I but, just, I just, I just panicked and I just drove. And I know, and, and I, I, know I went were, through a million and one scenarios in my head of what to do, and none of them were good. All of them just ended bad. You know, okay, I just, I didn't pay attention to anything. I just drove, and as I drove, I just. I didn't, I didn't read any signs. I didn't. I just drove, and I just tried to think about a fix it. And I couldn't fix it. It was just bad all around. And I'm just like, no matter what, I'm screwed. Like I am screwed, no matter what. I can't go back. I can't. I can't go to the hospital now. If I do, how does that look? I don't even know what to do at this point. I'm just freaking out because I just didn't want any of this. I didn't want anything to do with any of that. I just want to be a good dad. I get it. I understand. <laughs> All right. And 
and Stephen, I want to I want to help you do the best you can from here. <laughs> okay. okay. And I know shit happens. It does. <laughs> it does. It happens to good people. Okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. I don't know where she is, and I can't take you to where she but is, you, and I'm still screwed because I we got to try to remember remember that I don't know where that was. I just. Okay. It was just a random place. Stephen keeps repeating that no matter what he says, he will end up in jail. Now, while this may be true, it's not always the case. Depending upon the severity of the case, stating the truth can help reduce the sentence or the harshness of it. Several days later, after persistent questioning, he finally revealed the events that unfolded on the evening of April 26, 2016. Stephen possessed a deep-seated hatred toward Trisha for having full custody over Faith, as he felt that she took pride in it, which belittled him. And despite his numerous claims of being the better parent, he also resented having to pay child support. So, armed with several pre-purchased items such as garbage bags, cleaning supplies, acid, and even a chainsaw, he made his trip to Hope Sound with a singular intention, to end Trisha's life. After he brought Faith with him to the Airbnb, he phoned Trisha, asking her to come to his place as Faith had fallen ill. This explained the unopened groceries as Trisha must have left in a hurry. Upon entering the house, Trisha was knocked unconscious, and when she regained her senses, Stephen stood over her, demanding her email password so he could email Trisha's close friends and family that she would be out of touch for a while. Seeing what was about to unfold, Trisha refused and began to scream for help. He then hit her with a club and sealed her fate by strangling her. To remove all evidence, he dismembered her body and then disposed them into containers filled with acid. He then loaded these canisters into her car and drove off. However, halfway through, he realized that her car was out of gas. As a result, he returned to his Airbnb and took his own car to go and purchase gas in a gas can. When he returned, he loaded Trisha's car with the newly purchased gas and drove off to a secluded area where he buried her remains in a hole that he had dug out the previous day. All of the equipment he had used to dismember her body was discarded into a nearby lake. However, it wasn't until later that this information was known. After agreeing to a deal of pleading no contest to the lesser charge of second-degree murder in exchange for revealing where he hid them, he took the officers to that location. However, upon arriving at the scene and discovering the state of Trisha's remains, the detectives realized the grave mistake they made, as the savage nature of the killing indicated that Stephen deserved to be on death row. Unfortunately, Stephen Williams went on to receive a sentence of only 35 years for the second-degree murder of Trisha Todd, and five years to be served concurrently for child neglect. Now, if you think the case of Stephen Williams was shocking, you need to check out my video on the terrifying case of Larissa Rodriguez.